Welcome to our Smart Hints and Tips webinar. I'm Karen Bonanno, the Founder and Managing Director of EduWebinar and I will be your host and presenter for this broadcast today. I have been a teacher, a teacher librarian, a Head of Department, Acting Deputy Principal, a Regional Advisor and an Education Officer. I've been working in education for over 30 years and also with professional associations at the state, national and international level. A lot of our work has been face to face but with the technology we're able to transact a lot of this in a virtual space just as we're doing today in delivering professional learning and also networking. Before I begin the presentation I'll just cover some basic operational matters and you need to be aware that the views and opinions, the resources and the web links that I share with you are general information as a starting point for you to be able to do further research and identify how you would be able to use some of the content and the information specifically where you're working. So let's get started now into the content in this Smart Hints and Tips. Prior to the webinar I sent out an email that had the link to the content that we were going to be looking at and also a data capture form. The article here on 21 things every 21st century teacher should do this year has been posted by Carl Hooker. Now Carl is an educator in the USA. He is Director of Innovation and Digital Learning in his school district and he's posted this because Basically this is the beginning of their school year in North America at this stage and some of the ideas I want to explore with you as to how you might engage in some of these practices yourself. If you have had a chance to have a look at that then you would have also received the data capture form and we'll look at what people have entered in thus far and you can see down the side here is that form about what innovative activity have you done, why did you do that and what learning outcomes did you achieve uh, with your students as a result of that? But we'll look at that a little bit later part way through and you may have time and afterwards you might want to enter some details in there as well. So the very first post or the very first point that Carl raises is posting a question of the week on your classroom blog. What you can do here is use some of the tools that are out there to do that. One being the kid blog. Now this is a safe environment. It is uh, able to be utilised by students. It doesn't require too many logins or information. In fact, any of the posts that the students put into the kid blog are private and they're only for the class to see. The teacher though can take some of the material or post their own and have that publicly available but it is a safe space for kids to be able to engage in blogging. The other aspect is you as a teacher could establish an edgy blog and you could set up the class blog and do posts or invite students in to be able to add their information. So there's different ways that you can put the questions in. The thing is, what sort of content would you put into this space? You could make some posts about curriculum related activities. It may be the content that you're covering that week and the resources that you might use, which means the students can then click on this to access some of the material, particularly if it's web based or it may be related to your intranet where they can access resources. You might even post some aspects about what you want to achieve for the week, what learning outcomes that you have set for them. The other thing is at the end of the week there could be a summary like what has you know what they know, what they want to know and what they've learnt. All in all what this does is provide a space for you to engage in helping kids to understand what digital citizenship's about by modelling the type of posts that they can put online, how they interact online, what type of comments are appropriate and inappropriate. All of this can happen just purely by blogging and some people may well, you'd say well you know blogging's kind of a, a done thing, it, it's, it's had its day. Well no it hasn't, it's quite a great environment to be able to start to teach students how to behave online, particularly younger students. 
Now, the other type of blog platforms that can be available, one of them is if you are a Google school, you may want to use the uh, Blogspot, I think it's called. Uh, originally used to be called Blogger. So that, again, is a, is a Google-owned uh, environment. The next one is looking at having a class Twitter account. You can post the tweets of the day's learning or it may be just doing a post a week. I've given you some resources here. There are lots of websites out there which give you a lot of these 60 ways to use Twitter in the classroom, 50 ways to use Twitter in the classroom. These are just some examples that I've found which could be useful for you in consideration of things like communication. So you can use Twitter as a bulletin board or you can use it as a way of communicating with parents and encouraging them to follow the Twitter account so that they can see what's happening with the classroom activities. They might also get to know what upcoming events are taking place. The other thing is looking at organisation. So you can capture a summary of the learning at the end of the day, just like you could have in a blog, but it's a shorter. You only have 140 characters to do that, which means it's sharp and concise and to the point. You may use the class Twitter account to put information out about relevant links that the students can go to that's appropriate for them, relevant to their content that they're covering in class, relevant to the particular year level. Even quotable quotes, which can be inspirational for the students. Using Twitter account for developing writing skills, looking at uh, vocabulary and how it can be developed, looking at the brevity of a message, making sure that you get the information across pretty quickly. Now what I thought we'd do is even have a look at one teacher's classroom account. So here the teacher has set up her classroom Twitter account under her name and what she is able to do here is post particular messages that she's actually posted but also if we go down a little bit further you'll see that the students have accessed uh, her account and have entered. Now right here you can see this is an opportunity to look at some of the vocabulary, uh, some of the spelling, all of those sorts of things. But here we've got this one's posted by um, Braden. You can see that it's fairly easy to do and you have to be aware though that uh, there is only one Twitter account per profile. So if you already have a personal Twitter account, you would need to set up something like maybe a Gmail account to then establish a class account. Uh, images are really important, videos are important, as well as including the text for your post. It creates that dynamic environment. But here, what can happen is that the teacher is able to share with the parents. So the parents, if I just go up to the top, uh, you'll see the uh, follow tag or the follow button. Parents can then follow what's happening with that particular account. The other thing that you can do that Carl Hooker talks about in his post is having the school's own or the class own hashtag. Now what can happen here is again it can allow the parents to also post on their personal account but include the hashtag and this starts this contribution to the conversation and the kids can get a kick out of that because they can see that the parents are posting including the hashtag and then they can follow that particular Twitter stream to see what's happening in that environment. The other thing that can happen is you can participate in a Twitter chat by making sure that you have that hashtag in there. And that way then you can indicate to the parents that you're going to have a Twitter chat around a specific time and this is when the kids are going to be looking at some Q&A. You might even bring in a guest author or a community member or even a parent who has a particular expertise or hobby interest that the students might interact with. So it can be a dynamic environment that can be streamed and it can be projected so that the students can see how that stream is going. The other thing, going back to the first point about blogs, you can link in or sync your Twitter account to your blog. So lots of ideas there of what you can do for that. The next one is uh, basically making a parody of a hit song. The example I've given here was one that I saw recently where it was a 
uh, posted on YouTube and it was a hit song from the movie Frozen with the Let It Go and it was quite cleverly done. The images were the same, the voice was uh, lip synced over the top and it was about bringing back overdue library books. Uh, so quite fascinating how that can be done. You can use this basically to uh, get the kids to have some creative activity writing their own lyrics to a particular song. And as I said, one of the points is the lip dub video. You can capture and produce it, but watch your copyright restrictions is what I would encourage you to do. In this case, there may have been some breach of copyright here in the use of the Disney song but you need to look at making sure that you stay within the copyright jurisdictions for your particular locality and area. The thing that you can consider doing here is looking at the Creative Commons videos because you can do a number of things with the Creative Commons videos that you can't do with, with others under the restrictions. So just be aware of that. But even if you do, you don't need to post it onto YouTube, you may just capture the video yourself and make it available within a space where the students can see the work that they have done. Then we get into the creating an infographic as a review. There are lots of different programs that can be used. I've given you a link here for tools that you can go and check later on uh, easily. Uh, infogram, one recently that I found that has, has come onto the scene in the last couple of years is Canva, C-A-N-V-A. It's free and it's also handy to be able to do other innovative activities as well, like blog graphics or posters or Facebook covers or MIM graphics, and we'll get to MIMs a little bit later. But with the infographic, you can do lots of things in using stats to create an infographic, using demographics, using timelines of events, for example, what happens on the internet in a minute, all of those things and there are different uh, places where you can go to see, you can even do a search on infographics and you'll see all the different images out there that can be used and there are different tools. It's really a case of use your creativity, it could be looking at things like, you know, what are we eating and so capturing data from the students and then create an infographic which looks at the percentage of number of, of people who are eating fruit, eating vegetables, all those sorts of things can happen. There's a whole host of ways that you can use infographics uh, in a classroom environment. Let's get into going paperless for a week now or a day, it depends. This all depends on how tech connected you all are in, uh, in the particular environment. But it means that if you go paperless for a day, it means that what you've got to do is start looking at how you can use the technology. There are different things that can happen here. You can get your students even thinking how to make things more digital and they might be able to identify that. Uh, you might even basically do some um, you know, limited access to, uh, to devices. I mean, there's all sorts of things where you can set up challenges, but consider your workplace scenarios where less paper can be used. So it might mean doing a bit of brainstorming, saying, okay, well, where did, where did you go on the weekend where you could see people using less paper? And how did they do that? So you can start using things like blogs or Google Docs or using different devices. On the flip side of that, the suggestion is to have a no tech day. And that means you can start engaging in things like more in reading, more storytelling, role play, dramas, board games. I'm sure that there are all different things that you can brainstorm with your students to say, okay, we go paperless so we start using some of the technology or we have a no tech day so we start getting involved in more interaction and life hands-on, all sorts of things. So think about that, how you might want to use that within the classroom space. Carl mentions using Listly to create lists. Really what Listly is about is creating lists and it can be like lists of resources as we see here on this image and then you get other people to help you to build your list so it's called crowdsourcing so people add to the list around the particular topic. You can also see here where they bring in the democratic approach is that people vote on what's their favourite. So as the votes happen, it will change how this appears. There are all different ways that you can use um, Listly and then if you go to Listly, 
you can do a search on education and you'll see that lots of people are using Listly to create lists and it's like a curation tool and it means that you can provide the students with your Listly link and then they can access the resources and so you can have multiple uh, Listly link lists dealing with the content area that you're covering. So you're sharing that, sharing that information, you're engaging with the students, they can click on those particular links in your list and go to the resources that will be relevant and applicable to the content that you're covering in the classroom activities that you have happening. Then the next one is mentioning about selfies. Now I would prefer us to not encourage that so I'm just going to do a little push that out and say let's prefer MIMS. There are all different MIMS. Now what MIMS are, are basically uh, an image or a video or a piece of text. Usually it has a little bit of element of humour in it and it's created and posted and then it's spread rapidly in a viral capacity. You can have all different variations. So I've given an example here of this image. You'll see this image multiple times because it is a Creative Commons type image and what people do is they put their own text over the top and you will see that. You'll probably see a lot of it in Facebook posts where people uh, use those in, in multiple environments. Now just to give you an example of that, so here we've got different type of MIMS that people have used and this is just uh, a Pinterest. So if we go down a little bit there's some interesting ones. Okay, so here we've got, I mean this dog one is quite popular. I've seen this one recently where the, instead of saying the homework looks hard, do you, you want me to eat it, it said that the grammar and spelling was atrocious, I really can't eat this. So it's same image but, but different text over the top. So there's images you can use, uh, there's quotes you can use, there's cartoons that you can use. There are all different things that uh, you can use to create uh, MIMS that you can post about what's happening. And if I go back to the presentation, you'll see that I've given you some MIM generators and these are free. You can basically use these tools to be able to create these MIMS and add them. So they could be things that you put into uh, your blog or they could be images that you tweet. There's different ways you can use this in relation to the other innovative activities that have been mentioned. So going to first of all the activity that or the pre-webinar activity that I set for you which basically asked about what innovative activity have you done, why did you do this and what learning outcomes did you achieve. So just before I go I'll look at a question here, what age restrictions for students having accounts for online tools such as Listly, Twitter etc. Um, are these tools that we should create teacher accounts and then allow students to access? Carol, a little bit of both there. Basically there is age restrictions and you need to look at the terms of references that are uh, within the, you usually got to go right to the bottom, it looks of terms of service. You will find that the majority of them are 13 and over because that is the legal age with a lot of these based in the USA. But I would suggest that what you do is that the teacher creates an account. And as I said before in relation to Twitter, if you've already got your own account, you will, only, you will have to set up another email, so a, a Gmail for instance, and then create that using that Gmail account because you can only have one Twitter account per profile. So set that up, you can then get students, they could even post things and email to you, you could then enter that or you could give the students the access and in class time to do that. Once you've done that you might change your password so that they're not accessing it out of, out of time. There are different ways that you can basically use these. With the Listly I wouldn't be giving students that but I would be as a teacher setting up a Listly account and posting lists about the resources that could be used so that students at the time can go and look at the resources for the content, the content that's being covered. So just think about that but mainly look at the different terms of references that you use for each account to know what your, what your restrictions are. So let's go out to data capture form or the responses. 
So here, this is what people have put in in response to that pre-webinar activity. So one person here has set up a blog and basically they've, they've asked students to participate. They've given their reason why, that it's students are involved in some TAFE commitments. So this will be in a high school environment. They've given their link so you can check that out. But the idea is trying to help students who are missing class activities. So students, outcomes here, students interested did have the advantage of group essay writing. They, those who found note taking difficult were able to take their own time to review the lessons. Uh, here the parody song, not quite like that, but here the student was able to have skills in doing rapping, so they presented that. Students would shine in this field and I wished I'd vid videoed it. So here was what I was referring to before about security. Yeah, video it, but maybe don't post it anywhere. Uh, basically keeping it secure, just sharing it with the students within your, your school. Let's just go down a little bit to see. Okay, here we've got uh, post a question a week on the classroom blog. So here, using it as a means of communicating, so 2012 used it a fair bit for the National Year of Reading. Learning outcomes besides the interaction of kids uh, who enjoy doing similar things, e.g. cartoon and reading, explore different online tools, experiment a bit, observing copyright and creative practice. Yeah, a great way to use the post to bring those sorts of things and attention. Uh, Twitter account requiring students to create a tweet, valuable classroom reviews of the lessons. Yeah, so basically using it as a review environment. Going into the next stage, creating a class Pinterest account. Again, what happens here is this is just like a huge virtual notice board where you pin resources and websites to that. And you're then able to share the URL of that Pinterest account with your students. So the URL is public, remember that. Uh, but basically you can have different boards for different subject content and you can pin the relevant resources. Just to give you an idea, this person here has a board called Kids Stuff and they pin all different web links and so forth to that board. And what happens is that people can uh, repin that on their Pinterest. So there's a lot of repins here, people indicating that they, they love this. So one comment there. Uh, here, Julie has got a preschool kindergarten account and they've got different uh, pins happening here. So you can set up that. Again, it's a, a similar to a curation um, tool that you can use in a, in a Pinterest environment. This would be more for you as a teacher, collecting these pins and then sharing the URL because it is public with the students as for resources that they can access. So just using the technology in a different way to be a little bit smarter in what you're doing. Something that's probably become popular in the sense that it's become a more recent activity is the concept of app smashing. Now of course you need to have the tools to be able to do that. The most common tool is the iPad. Now what it involves is that the workflow is that you create something in one app then you move it to another app and do something in that app and then move it to another app and keep doing that until you've got this final result. To give you an idea of that, I've got a couple of samples here and we will have a look at these online. Using it for video projects or using it for digital storytelling. This site which looks at digital storytelling on the iPad. Now what this person has done, uh, I'll just go down a little bit here, they've set out the objective which is to create a digital storytelling project that illustrates knowledge in effective and appropriate ways. They've indicated the apps that they've used, they've indicated the workflow that's been involved, and then they've also included short tutorials. So what's happened here is the students have used one particular app, uh, used a graphic app, used a little bit more in capturing in a camera roll, putting it into iMovie, bringing in other bits and pieces like sound and so forth and then producing uh, their video and putting it up into the cloud or to Dropbox. So there's different things. Admittedly it is a complex process and you'd probably need to, uh, to, to go through that. Just to give you an example here, if I go to another site, the students here have used uh, animated paper. They've created the images and then put them into a particular environment here. So they've imported the hand-drawn images into Explain Everything. 
then they've created the animation movement with camera captures on a on a basis, brought it into uh, iMovie and put in their sound and then published to YouTube or Vimo. So have a look at these two sites when you get a chance, if you have, of course, the technology available to you to be able to do the app smashing. But that's what it's about. And I, when we go to the data capture form results, you'll see that some people have actually done this. So it is possible to do within a school environment. Going to this one, and again, others might have heard this before, but I've only just recently come across this. And this is the ift.com to make your life easier. What it does, it, it's a case of uh, if this, then that. And what we've got here is, as an example here, if I take a picture using Instagram, then put it into my Evernote account. So once you set up one task, you can then share that and that becomes what they call a recipe. Another example is if I watch a new video in YouTube, then place it in my Evernote account. Or if I upload a photo to Facebook, then post it to Twitter. In this case here for this one, if on Twitter there is a post about geography resources, then put it into my Evernote. And you have to go in and set up the tasks to indicate what you want to do. If it finds something, then you want it to put it to somewhere. And I would suggest this is the best tutorial that I've found thus far to help you to look at creating those workflows to do things like if um, I upload a, a photo to Facebook, then also post that to, to my Twitter. And what it does, essentially, it does make life easier because what you're doing is syncing across multiple channels. So in this environment, there are 130 channels, things like uh, YouTube and Delicious and Dropbox, uh, SMS. So, you know, here with the weather, um, if the temperature drops below uh, SMS me to make sure I rug up, all those sorts of odd quirky little things. And you might, for you as a teacher, you might want to use that to capture resources because often when we've got different time zones, you may miss a tweet because when you log in, there's been lots of other tweets. So you can set up that when there is a tweet about history, you can get it to be pushed into your Evernote history folder really quite handy to, to have. And so you might want to look at that and look at then how you can then use the resources. So the idea is not necessarily doing this with students, but using it for yourself to make sure you don't miss some valuable material that you may have through your uh, personal learning network. Okay, let's go on to looking at making a class book in a digital environment. Again, you would need to have access to the technology, but this, this is what you know, some of this innovative stuff's about. And some of you may have already done this. Book Creator is quite useful for the uh, primary years or elementary years, and uh, Flip Snack becomes a little bit more robust in your, your secondary or high school environment. Here's a link I've given you that you might want to have a look at. But what it can be is the students can create the, the class book they may do it as groups or they, it might be an individual task and then they would basically start to look at uploading and developing that and then sharing that within these particular environments. And again, you know, you would use these other environments like you'd tweet, you'd blog, all those sorts of things so they can share it with the parents of, of what their result has been. This one, participate in a mystery hangout and I've added here mystery Skype. With a hangout environment, you can basically, there's this link here gives you different types of access to information resources about how people are using that within schools and would allow you to connect up with other people. This link here on Mystery Skype is also connecting you up with other classroom folk who are doing the same thing. Now Mystery Skype is looking at, you have to guess where the location of the other class is by asking questions you can look at how you can find what other people are doing in the mystery Skype. 
So really what it is, it's an educational game linking up two classrooms on Skype and the game is to guess the location of the other class by sharing questions or by asking questions. So going down here, further down, this is where you look at connecting up with people. So here if we were to look at connecting up in Australia with just Australian people, you can choose your age bracket, let's do 6 to 11, and then what it will do is resort that information and you will be able to find people in that space who are classroom teachers. I mean, Anne is someone I know from Victoria, very active in the technology environment. So Anne would be a good person to connect up with. You may even know some of these other people. And you can then email them or tweet them about connecting up your class in a Mystery Skype environment. So that's just one example. So I'd, I'd probably go Mystery Skype. It depends on whether you have that because there is uh, Skype for class, for education, all of these things can happen or you can do your Google Hangouts. Whichever way you do it, you're still using the technology to display the other people at the other end as well as your class, be able to get your questions in and get people engaged in in that exchange of information then to work out where they are. The other thing is you can do things like bring in a guest if you don't want to do the guest the location you can use Skype or, or Hangout to bring in a guest from another location, an expert in the field, and have them connected. And students then can engage in Q&A to be able to develop their knowledge about a particular location or develop their knowledge about a particular topic if you've brought in a guest author, guest presenter, guest speaker for the students to, to engage with. Then the next one that uh, Carl refers to is looking at creating an audio podcast. There are different tools that you can use for doing that, um, Audacity, GarageBand. If you do have something like Camtasia, you can export the audio once you, you capture it. So the things you can do, school could host a radio show or they could do some interviews. There are different things that you can get the kids to do and then these particular environments is, are where you could host your final content that is developed by the students. All different things that can happen with audio and it's a great way of getting kids to maybe, uh, it could be in relation to some content area that you're doing that the students develop their interview, they go out and they capture that as part of the classroom uh, assessment processes when they're looking at something like, let's say they're doing something about um, immigration in history, they could interview someone, a family relative or friend, and they could uh, capture that and use that as part of the, the learning process for the curriculum. This one here about becoming an activist for a worthy cause, I would say just becoming active for a worthy cause. Now I've given some links here for Australia that could be an opportunity because we often have days of the year or months of the year. Example here, September at the moment is Save the Koala Month. You could get the students involved in looking at how they could be active in saving a koala, looking at the habitat, looking at what they eat, uh, looking at how people are engaged in scientific research to make sure that the koala doesn't become an extremely endangered species. Each month there's something happening, each week there's something happening. You could look at becoming an activist or becoming active for a worthy cause to get students to look at that. So the community site has different calendars and also the Australian government site has calendars as well where you can find that information and build it into your yearly activity or your weekly activity. And then the final one is, is looking at, well, let students drive the learning. And this may be a little bit of a risk, but also too, I think it's a great opportunity to help them to take charge of some of the learning that's happening within the classroom. And there's some tips there of how you can promote that. But the main thing is that knowing that learning or, or the classroom space is a safe place to make mistakes. Um, it's also a safe place to, to fail because it's an environment where you can learn from those mistakes. You can get immediate feedback from your peers in the class or from the teacher and that you can change what the, what the t 
task is that you might have been doing or the process you were adopting to do that and do it again and see if it produces a different result. Give them that can-do attitude, that they can do this, that there, there is uh, no limitation of what they can do in the class, giving the student their voice and also encouraging the curiosity, uh, maybe providing them with some uh, stimulus to, to get their inquiry minds going and then letting them drive the learning. And it could be just for a day um, or it could be for a section of time. I know that there are curriculum content that needs to be covered, but just do this for a day and see how the students can take charge of, of what's happening. So going back again to the pre-webinar activity about what interactive activity you were doing, what, how wide did you do this and the learning outcome. And this is where um, I indicated that some people were already doing app smashing. In here, someone says, I wanted to create an avatar who was explaining the use of the library catalogue and use the same principle for creating a library quiz for Book Week. Um, apps used, uh, iPad Sketch, uh, Telegammy and Movie QR codes. Why engagement, enjoyment, flipped learning, modelling. So there's an example that someone has given. Another one here, haven't done this yet, uh, year, ITE course, heavily using iPads, using apps, App Smash to create multiple media content. Um, some students have already used more than one app to complete their assignment. So here it's a realistic way of being able to use the utilities. Podcasting here, recapping on a topic, good way to get a lot of uh, information in a digestible form for upper secondary. They're able to listen to it many times, it's portable. Students are able to use this technology to revise. Yeah, great. So some good ideas there. It really is a case of thinking about what you have access to by the way of technology. Uh, remember, there is a, a day where there's no tech or you could have a, a period of time that there's no tech. Think about how you could use some of these and it's a way that just creates this element of difference. It creates interest. It starts to get them in contact with some of the tools that they're probably using for all different things in their day-to-day -day activity outside of school and it brings it in to help them to engage in the learning and use it as a way to provide a different pathway to the resources that you're using or to curriculum content. Just in regard to EduWebinar, we do have other events apart from our Smart Hints and Tips. The webinars we've got coming up, one is on developing info-savvy students, which is building critical literacy capabilities. Another one is on action research to inform decision making on collection development. In specific area here we're looking at ebooks. And then we have another one on designing learning spaces for student engagement. So making dynamic spaces and places either within classroom or within the school library. EduWebinar is a membership site where we do provide professional learning. You can either be involved in subscribing on a monthly basis uh, so you pay so much per month and or you can come in and, and be there for the year. Either way, you can work out how this might fit within your budget. But the crucial part is behind the, the, the front end of the website, you, as a member, as a paid member, you have access to over 30 hours of archived professional learning replays plus the extra resources. So for each webinar we host, we then source other resources that complement the content and as a member you have access to that replay at any time and you also have access to several other resources that support the content. We've looked at innovative activities through the eyes of someone else's post but taking a little bit further to look at how you can engage students by using just one or two of those activities in your classroom. So I hope you've picked up some ideas. I hope that you um, have also got some idea of what other people are doing and that you can see that it is possible to do some of those tasks. So thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you again at our next Smart Hints and Tips. So enjoy the rest of your day or evening depending on where you are in the world and thanks for coming and being involved in this particular webinar.